All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you are doing great uh, today. Um, so, yeah, first of all, thanks to uh, all of you for attending this uh, webinar. And um, super happy that we are finally able to uh, talk about Traffic V3, the latest version um, of uh, the project. Uh, and first of all, let's uh, introduce ourselves. I'm Emil Vos, the uh, creator of Traffic, and, uh, and also the uh, CTO and founder of uh, Traffic Labs. And I'm Nicolas Mangin, I'm Traffic Maintainer, uh, Head of Support at Traffic Labs, and I co this uh, webinar with Emil. All right. Um, so yeah, before um, digging deeper into the uh, latest version uh, of Traffic, um, let's get back to uh, the beginning. And this all started in 2015. So that's almost 20, 10 years ago already. Um, and at that time, uh, I was uh, a developer and working on setting up microservices platform. And as you might remember in 2015, it was pretty early. The ecosystem was almost empty. Uh, Kubernetes was not here. Docker was uh, super early. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it was pretty early. And I needed to expose automatically microservices on the internet. And that's how everything started. Um, I um, started to uh, work on the project and the first comic commit came in August 2015 and uh, that was the beginning of traffic the project so yeah what is traffic uh, at the end of the day um, it's um, a reverse proxy a gateway slash an ingress controller uh, it's a it it has been made for the cloud native world and uh, it handles all the uh, traffic management uh, for your cluster uh, from the simple load balancings to uh, the advanced canary uh, uh, release management it handle the security aspect with for example tls certificate management and it, it handles of course uh, uh, observability of all your uh, requests uh, through uh, tracing through logs through metrics etc uh, what makes it stands out from other solution? Uh, as I said, I've uh, built it to be cloud native. Uh, so uh, it is integrated with uh, almost every uh, orchestrator out there. It can be Kube, it can be uh, uh, Docker, it can be Nomad, whatever. Any basically uh, um, uh, uh, cloud native tool is integrated with traffic. Uh, and that's what makes it uh, super useful. It is extremely lightweight, read and go. Um, and um, uh, everything is uh, in a single binary and it's extremely simple uh, so you can uh, have access to advanced feature uh, but the user experience uh, stay extremely simple uh, so I founded the company traffic labs and uh, raised some money uh, and we've been uh, able to uh, release traffic one the first uh, major release and uh, we also uh, have been able to hire a team and uh, move to uh, a new office with uh, a giant uh, traffic logo, uh, which was pretty amazing. <laughs> Let's move to uh, the next uh, period, which is 2019, 2020. Uh, we released traffic 2.0, um, uh, which was called Mondor. Uh, so the second major release of traffic and uh, we uh, closed another round of funding and we've been working on the uh, commercial product of our uh, uh, of our project which is traffic hub uh, and the uh, interesting part of traffic hub is that it's a super set of traffic the open source project uh, and it's focusing on exposing securing and managing uh, all your services and your API, so it, it has really a, a focus a focus on the API uh, uh, market. Uh, and if we um, if we dig deeper, uh, the great differentiator of uh, Traffic Hub is that it grows it grows with you, uh, uh, starting from 
exposing uh, your application and uh, growing with you through your API journey uh, from the application proxy to the API gateway uh, with um, um, additional features like authentication, authorization, up to the API management, which is uh, a bit more complex with API governance, um, API observability, and uh, developer portal. Everything which uh, helps you to manage uh, API fleet. And finally, uh, today, 2024, uh, we release finally the third major version of traffic, uh, traffic three. Um, and uh, uh, I also want to uh, just uh, get back to the uh, uh, crazy numbers of the uh, traction of traffic because it's, uh, it's really uh, an open source success story. More than 3 billion downloads, uh, 47,000 stars on GitHub. Uh, it's in the top 15 most downloaded project on Docker Hub, which is kind of mind blowing. And, uh, and finally, most importantly, more than 700 contributors so far on the project. So clearly it's not, um, you know, a project managed by a company, but it's a community project and anybody can have some impact uh, on this project. So I'm super proud of that. All right, uh, so it's time to um, uh, get back to the main topic, which is traffic three. Uh, so we will uh, focus on uh, key features uh, that is that are part of this release. Of course, the uh, release note is uh, way more, <laughs> way bigger than that. Uh, but those are the key features that we want to highlight. Uh, WebAssembly, OpenTelemetry, um, Gateway API for Cube, uh, Spiffy, HTTP3, uh, also Tailscale. Um, and then st let's start with uh, OpenTelemetry and Nico. Thank you, Emil. So Emil talked about uh, microservices, and it's true that when you have to um, manage um, microservices and your infrastructure, Observability is a must have. So when we talk about uh, observability and monitoring, we talk mainly about three kinds of data, tracing, logs, and metrics. So where the tracing helps you to monitor the performances of your infrastructure to understand why, for instance, um, the traffic slows down to, uh, with your application. It allows you to find bottlenecks, to solve the issue, to speed up the response time of your application. Here you can see uh, a Jaeger UI. So Jaeger is a famous tool for tracing. So first of all, you can see what we call a trace. So the trace is a time spent by a request in an application. We can see here that this trace lasts uh, more than 13 milliseconds in traffic. A trace is split in many subparts, named the span. Each span uh, is a part of uh, the application where <clears throat> the, applic the request pass through. So here we can see that we go into a rate limiter and we spend most of the time in the reverse proxy part. We can tell that, say that because it's in dark blue and dark blue is uh, in Jaeger, the critical path of the request in your application. Second data, type of data, uh, it's a log. So logs allows you, as you know, to monitor the behavior of your applications, of traffic, of everything you have installed in your infrastructure. Uh, having a central tool to monitor the log allows you to uh, find easily the errors, to raise alert in the middle of the night, and to solve <clears throat> faster the issues. Because instead of having to use grep on a lot of, a lot of files together, you have, uh, like here, a uh, low-key um, UI where you can see every log here from traffic. So it's faster to debug and to solve the issues. And uh, last but not least, metrics. So with an application like traffic, metrics allows you to monitor your incoming traffic, to know how many requests uh, are reaching uh, your infrastructure, the rate of errors. It will allow you to scale up uh, the number of applications, for instance, to be able to handle uh, this incoming traffic and then uh, scale down when uh, the traffic is back to normal. Here you can see, uh, for instance, a Grafana dashboard. 
So in uh, Traffic V2, we have brought support for uh, many uh, vendors because there are a lot of vendors for monitoring. And this is a difficulty because they are all different. For this reason, it has been decided to uh, create a standard and it's where open telemetry comes. So open telemetry is an open source project, a CNCF project. It's a merge between open tracing, which is a standard for everything around tracing, and open census, which is standard for both tracing and metrics. So open telemetry brings specifications, but implementations too, because you will find SD key for many languages like Go. And another interesting thing brought by open telemetry is what we call the semantic conventions. Uh, there are metrics and span that you have to provide if you want to say that you support the open telemetry um, specification, but we will see it later. If you want to uh, handle open telemetry um, metrics and trace uh, in your infrastructure, the recommended way is to install an open telemetry collector. This collector will be in charge of importing data for the providers, data providers like traffic. In this hotel collector, you will be able to transform this data if you need it. And after that, the collector will export the data to your Prometheus, Datadog, or Jaeger. At traffic, observe, in traffic tra labs, tra observability has always been very important. And um, in traffic V2, for instance, we have brought the implementation of open tracing. That's why it was kind of natural uh, and uh, normal for us to bring open telemetry support. In traffic V3, we have brought the metrics, the tracing support, but not the logged one. Why? Because logs uh, specification for open telemetry is very recent. Uh, it seems to me it's end of uh, last year, and the Go SDK implementation is still in progress. Of course, we take a look to it, and as soon as uh, the implementation is ready, we will bring it in traffic. But let's see a demonstration together. So uh, for the demonstration, we install a, install a web server on the K3S, uh, which is a Kubernetes cluster, and the traffic. So the web server display uh, a sentence in ASCII art and some headers. And we have configured our traci uh, traffic instance to provide both metrics and tracing at the open telemetry format. As you can see here, we, were, we, direct, we have a direct access to a Prometheus and Jaeger because if using an open telemetry collector is uh, the recommended way to, uh, to um, handle open telemetry metrics in, uh, and tracing in your infrastructure, or POC demonstration and development, having a direct uh, a vendor direct access can be done and is enough. So now uh, let's take a look to uh, the web server. So we will go in the traffic dashboard. And uh, in this dashboard, we will uh, take a look to our routers and more specifically to uh, the router's name metrics.docker.localhost which is uh, the way to expose our web server. Here, as you can see on the right, we have added a middleware, a rate limit middleware. With this middleware, we will not only generate <clears throat> 200 response code, but as we will rate limit the access, uh, we will send 429 response code too when the requests are rate limited. So now if we take a look to the Jaeger UI, uh, we can see that there are different traces with more or less span and that last not the same time. This one is similar to the one we have seen previously, but if, if we extend uh, a span like uh, the rate emitter one, we can see that uh, we are using the OTLP span format because it uh, respects the semantic convention we have talked uh, about uh, previously. So we can see that uh, this request uh, pass through a lot of part and spend a lot of time in the reverse proxy. A lot of time, uh, it's less than 10 milliseconds, okay? And uh, we response, uh, we, the response is a 200. It means that the request went well. Now, 
Let's take a look to uh, another request, uh, which is faster, less than one second, only five span. As you can see, the last span here is a rate limiter because this request was rate limited. And we can see if we expand here that the response code is a 429. We can have a Grafana dashboard too with uh, open telemetry metrics. So if we refresh it, uh, the, the dashboard, you can see that we only have for the moment uh, 200 and 429 as a response code. But what happens if our application shuts down? So let's just delete the pod. Now you can see that we will generate only 404. So if we go back to the Jaeger UI, uh, it allows us to see that this request will be faster than all the other ones. Now we refresh here, and every time we only have two span, because at the beginning of the pipeline in traffic, we detect that we don't have any backend for the uh, for the for the rule, and we uh, answer a 404. If we go now in the dashboard and we refresh uh, the data, we will see that on top of uh, 200 and the 429 response code, we have now the 404. Let's take a look uh, to this uh, diagram. We can see here that we are using HTTP server request duration seconds count, which is another semantic convention. So it means that, imagine that today you are using Nginx and you are using this data for your dashboard. After this webinar, you will use Traffic V3 and you will be able to replace Nginx with Traffic by and keeping the same uh, dashboard. So, this is it for open telemetry. And now let's talk about Gateway API. So with Gateway API, you are at 100% in Kubernetes because as you maybe know, it's the next standard to expose services. So to understand why we need a new standard, let's do some history and let's go back once again in 2015. So it's uh, the year of the first commit of traffic, but not only because it was the beginning of Kubernetes and the ingress specification comes with it. So the promise of uh, the ingress specification was to be simple and vendor neutral. However, this simplicity that should be its strength was its weakness because it's not simple to expose an application. You just don't want to expose it. You quickly want to add headers, to rate limit the access, as we have done during the, the demo, to um, filter the IP. To do so with the ingress, you had to add vendor specific annotations. So first, simplicity is promise is broken because annotations are not easy to maintain. And vendor neutral promise is broken too because you have to use vendor specific annotation. That's why in 2019, we have wrote our own specification, our own CRD, the ingress route. It allowed us to bring support for TCP and UDP on top of HTTP to create our own middleware object to uh, ease the maintenance. Now you can you define a middleware used by many ingress and everything is defined using the spec section of uh, the CRD. It means that everything is structured and validated. It's not uh, the case for annotation, so it's simpler to maintain. It was beginning of 2019 with Traffic V2, and at the end of the same year, it was decided to uh, start working on a new specification, on a new standard that go beyond uh, the ingress specification that how uh, Gateway API has been born, was born, and uh, has been released in V1 at the end of 2023. Let's go deeper in Gateway API. So the main principle of Gateway API is to say that there is not only one person, not only one role to maintain a common test cluster, but many together. And on this screen, you can see we divided it in two kind of people, ops and dev. First, the ops. In the gateway API world, 
they are intended to define what we call a gateway class. The gateway class refer to a gateway controller, like traffic. As you can see on the snippet on the right, we define the gateway class with a name, and in the spec, we set a controller name. Here is traffic.io slash gateway controller. It means that every object that will uh, be attached to this gateway class will use a, get a traffic instance to expose uh, the workload. The second kind of objects um, handled by, uh, managed by the hops, by the hops are the gateway. Gateway objects are central in the Gateway API because it allows you to uh, manage the cluster access to uh, reach the application. So Gateway are defined with a name and using the option Gateway class name, they refer to the Gateway class. So here, every object that will be attached to the Gateway traffic GW will be attached to the traffic controller Gateway class. It means that they will be exposed through an instance of traffic. Still in the gateway, you define what we call a listener. The listener has a port to listen to, uh, to catch the, the request and redir redirect them to, re to your pods. So here we have named uh, the listener web is a port 403 for HTTP. And everything, uh, every re request uh, for the host name example.com can be handled by this gateway. Developers don't care about how it's exposed. They just want to expose their application. To do so with Gateway API, they can use root. They can use HTTP root, TLS root, gRPC root. When a developer define a root, the first thing is to define the parent ref and reference a gateway to expose the root. Of course, on the gateway side, you can define some policies or constraints to restrict the kind of root attached to the gateway or the host name, for instance. On the root side, you will define a matcher to uh, redirect the request and filters. Filters are operations you want traffic does on your request when they pass through it. But uh, let's see an example together. Here on the right, you can see an ingress. This ingress exposes the same web server as the one during the demo. And as you can see, instead of having a rate limit middleware, we added both um, header middleware and IP analysis to filter on the IP. On the, on the right, so sorry, it was on the left. And on the right, you can see uh, the same configuration using gateway API objects. So the first thing we can see is that we have three annotations on the ingress side and no annotation on the gateway side. The two first annotations allows you to define the entry point, where here in the gateway API, it's done using the listeners in the gateway. Still on the ingress, we define another annotation to list the ingress, uh, the middleware. In the HTTP route, everything is configured using the filters. Another thing, as you can see here, we only define one middleware because with the API, the gateway API specification comes different kind of filters. There are core filters, which are operation a gateway controller has to implement, just like uh, modifying the request. And on top of that, there are other kinds of filters such as extension ref. Extension ref are all the filters, all the operations you can do using a gateway controller that are not part of the, spe of the specification. So in traffic, using an extension ref allows you to use every middleware already um, present in traffic v3. So with traffic v3, uh, we have wrote support for HTTP, TLS, and filter. But the feature is still experimental. It's experimental because, as I said previously, the v1.0 of Gateway API was released uh, end of 2023. And we were about to release traffic v3.0 SC1. For such a reason, we kept it experimental. But we are still working on it and mainly working on the status reporting that is a very important part of uh, the specification. And our goal is to uh, GA as a feature ASAP and hopefully in traffic v3.1. 
So this is it for Gateway API. And now, uh, Emil, we'll talk about web assembly. Yeah, and I can share my screen uh, if you want, Nico. Wonderful. Yep. All right. I I'm going to wait just to be sure you can do it. Yeah, and sorry for that. <laughs> OK, it's not ideal, but I don't know what happened. Everything was ready, and of course, <laughs> OK. Um, <clears throat> Let's go. Um, so let's talk about WASM uh, or WebAssembly. And um, let's start with the beginning uh, of the story. Um, so the need uh, of uh, plugins or extensions for traffic, uh, especially for middlewares, uh, have been here for uh, quite some time. And very early in the project, uh, we had some uh, discussions uh, to build plugin. Um, but to build that, uh, uh, we needed a plugin engine. And it's not that easy, uh, and especially in Go. Um, so the first idea, of course, was to use the um, uh, plugin feature, uh, the native plugin feature uh, with, I mean, from Go, uh, from the language. Uh, but um, that's exactly what we uh, tried. Um, at the beginning, but uh, sadly, uh, we ended up with uh, many issues, uh, and mostly because the um, uh, uh, the uh, native plugin feature was uh, um, not able to uh, fulfill our our requirement. So yeah, we had to find another uh, technical technology, and um, at the end of the day, we ended up building our own technology. Um, so uh, that's how uh, Yagi uh, was started. And Yagi basically is a Golang interpreter. And uh, the goal of Yagi was to build the, uh, uh, the best Golang interpreter because there was uh, already a few uh, attempts uh, to build uh, an interpreter. Uh, but Yagi, yeah, was here to, uh, to be the best and the most complete uh, to be able to uh, uh, be uh, uh, fully compliant with the uh, Go specification. And that's uh, what we did. And uh, the project was extremely successful and uh, has been integrated to traffic uh, to build the plugin engine. And uh, this uh, led traffic to uh, have dozens of plugins made by the community uh, in its marketplace. Um, in its catalog. So extremely successful. Um, however, um, Yagi is uh, a Go interpreter and you have to uh, be familiar with Go uh, to write some plugins for traffic. And, uh, and not everyone is familiar with this language. Uh, many people want to write a plugin in a different language in JavaScript or whatever. And that's how um, the idea uh, of integrated uh, WebAssembly is interesting. Uh, so you probably already uh, know everything about this technology, but just in case, quick recap, uh, WebAssembly or WASM uh, basically is a, a portable binary code format. Uh, and what's extremely exciting about that is um, you can generate uh, a, a WASM binary from basically any language. Uh, it can be JavaScript, Java, C, C++, Rust, Go, whatever. And you can run WASM, WASMbly, uh, WASM binary, sorry, um, on, uh, on everything. It can be a browser, it can be a, a server. Uh, that's extremely um, flexible. Uh, so it's an, an open standard. Uh, and the community uh, is extremely active on that project. So this moves uh, pretty fast. Um, it is extremely uh, performant. Um, to give you an idea, it's almost the same as native performant. Uh, so it's kind of mind blowing. And uh, it has many implementation. As I said, you can write some uh, WASM uh, binary, you can compile some WASM binary from pretty uh, pretty much anything and run that on pretty much anything. Uh, so extremely ex interesting. 
And it's also safe uh, because uh, the binary runs in a VM, right? Uh, so uh, it is safer than just running uh, an exec here. Um, pretty interesting, right? So um, uh, the community uh, came up with the idea of integrating WebAssembly uh, to traffic to build the plugin engine, um, to build the second plugin engine. Um, and uh, that, I mean, I was saying at the beginning that the community had a great role uh, in this project, and that's the best example. Uh, Wasm, the Wasm ID came up from the community and was built by the community uh, in in a very short amount of time. Um, and um, and I mean, I just find this uh, ex I mean extremely great because it's one of the uh, uh, most exciting feature uh, of traffic three basically. <laughs> um, and to move forward, we wanted to build. Uh, a great plugin example uh, to uh, uh, to show how Wasm was uh, how powerful was uh, Wasm plugins, and um, um, what I mean, what a best uh, plugin uh, than uh, a web application firewall. Uh, so that's what we uh, uh, that's what we did. Uh, we integrated a, a web application firewall. Um, uh, within a plugin, uh, within a Wasm plugin uh, in Traffic V3. And we chose Corasa. They were, they were close already to us uh, uh, building the uh, Wasm integration. And Corasa basically is an open source project uh, under the uh, OWASP Foundation. Um, and the OWASP Foundation is basically, uh, uh, I mean, handling uh, security vulnerabilities uh, and management on the internet, and Corasa is an enterprise grade um, web application web application firewall. Um, it's it's um, uh, modern, ready to go. It is uh, fully compliant with the uh, mod security cycling language, uh, which is extremely interesting because that's what everybody knows, and it is hundred percent compatible with the uh, OWASP core rule set. Um, so extremely interesting. You can integrate core rule set directly uh, into Corasa and directly into traffic. Um, so let's let's see how it works. And of course, um, it is. I mean, uh, this new uh, uh, Corasa web application plugin is available within the plugin catalog. Let's see uh, how it works um, uh, within a demo. So uh, we will first uh, uh, deploy traffic, of course. Uh, and of course, we will deploy traffic with uh, a plugin, which is Corasa. Uh, so that's a Wasm plugin. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's the same uh, way to uh, deploy a plugin uh, with Yagi. We will also deploy uh, a middleware, uh, which is also a Corasa, the Corasa plugin. For now, you can see uh, that we have a bunch of uh, core configuration here, but at the end, you can see a sec rule in shine off, which means that we load Corasa, uh, but the uh, uh, engine is disabled. So yeah, the uh, web application firewall is just disabled for now. Let's deploy an ingress route and to uh, a vulnerable app um, that use the uh, 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 the middleware uh, we just deployed previously. And uh, let's open the uh, log following on this app. So this app is vulnerable to the uh, log for shell vulnerability, the, which was discovered a few years ago. And we will inject a malicious request uh, to this app. As, an, as you can see, uh, we have a huge stack trace, uh, meaning that uh, the request uh, hit the uh, app and hit the uh, vulnerability of the app, which is not great. <laughs> um, let's um, let's now uh, instead uh, enable uh, the um, uh, Corasa web application firewall, and uh, to do that, we will just switch on the uh, uh, the flag on the uh, config, and uh, let's open the log again on the app. All right, and if we um, 
if we this time send the, malicious, the, the same malicious request, you will see that we won't even hit uh, the app itself. We don't have any stack trace, any log. Uh, in fact, uh, the Corasa web application firewall uh, just intercepted the, uh, the malicious request and recognized that it was not great and just stopped it and uh, send the 403 error. Uh, so it prevent, uh, as uh, expected, it prevented any, um, any um, malicious request to, send, to, uh, to uh, reach to the app. So, it's, I mean, it's just great, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's extremely simple uh, to uh, uh, set up and you can have uh, advanced, uh, an advanced security within traffic as a plugin. Uh, so yeah, congrats to uh, to the community to bring that to the uh, to to, uh, to the project. All right, let's move to the uh, the next section, um, which is um, an important one because it's uh, it talks about uh, migrating and uh, how we've been working on making it, making it smooth, migrating from V2 to V3. Um, and we have been following uh, a simple philosophy. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, it's a major uh, version, so uh, breaking changes are fine. It's okay to have breaking changes, but they have to be minimal and under control. So that's one thing. And the second aspect is that uh, we want to provide a, a way uh, to users to migrate progressively from their V2 traffic instances to their V3, V3 traffic instances. We don't want to force users to upgrade all their ingress resources uh, to the new V3 format. It would be a, a nightmare. So we have built a way to do it progressively. And let's, uh, let, let's dig into it. And so first of all, you can uh, have access to the uh, uh, the uh, detailed migration guide where uh, we list all the uh, uh, all the uh, breaking changes uh, we have uh, that have been made to uh, traffic v3. Uh, and again, they are uh, minimal. Uh, they are very uh, uh, targeted, um, but but you have the whole list uh, in this migration guide. So the uh, the thing is. Um, we have made migration, I mean, the, 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 the static configuration have to be migrate, has to be migrated to the V3 format because there are some, a few breaking changes in the static configuration. Uh, and once you have migrated your static configuration, you can just run all your existing ingresses if you are on cube or existing label on Docker. Uh, it will continue to run even with the uh, with the old v2 format because the dynamic configuration of traffic v3 support both uh, v2 and v3 format so even though we have changes we have changed a bit uh, a few things in the dynamic configuration uh, uh, you won't have to uh, necessarily migrate everything uh, uh, at once so that's great because it allows you to progressively migrate all your ingress to the new format. Uh, so super, uh, super handy. Um, and of course, lastly, uh, uh, as soon as we uh, detect uh, on V3 that we have a V2 option uh, that is, you know, deprecated, uh, you will have some logs uh, warning and, um, and explaining what you have to, uh, to do instead. And, um, and linking to the documentation. So yeah, um, I guess uh, we have made uh, a huge work uh, on that to make it uh, as simple as possible. It doesn't prevent any, uh, I mean, the fact that we have, there are breaking changes, of course, in a major version, but we did everything we could to, uh, uh, to make this migration path as smooth as possible. And there are, uh, I mean, even though there are, uh, I mean, as I said, the uh, release note is huge. Uh, let's uh, dig deeper into uh, a few more uh, features. Nico. 
Yes, because uh, as Emil said, more than 100 pull requests uh, were merged in v3.0. We talked about open telemetry, WASM, Gateway API, but let's talk about uh, a few other interesting features. Emil, if you can click, please. Sorry. <laughs> so first, SPIFI. So SPIFI is a standard for identity control of applications. It's used an MTLS system. And uh, now with Traffic V3, you will be able to uh, handle your certificate in traffic to integrate traffic in the SPIFI flow. Uh, other feature is HTTP3. So HTTP3 was already present in Traffic V2, but as an experimental feature, so now it's GA. We have brought TailScale support. So TailScale is a VPN that uh, generates its own uh, self-signed TLS certificates to allow the service to communicate together. And now in Traffic V3, you will be able to integrate the certificates in traffic to uh, expose uh, the services in a TailScale network. And um, concerning the compressed middleware, so we have provided a compressed middleware for a while, but only with a gzip format, now you would be able to use a broadly two. But uh, don't hesitate to uh, take a look to, in GitHub to the release note. You will uh, have a global overview of the features uh, we have brought with Traffic V3. But uh, Emil, I guess you are one more thing to add. Yeah, one more thing. and. Uh... I, I read that uh, a few of you have uh, I mean, I've seen that the, the demo we were showing were kind of blurry. Uh, so don't worry, we will share, of course, uh, uh, the slides and everything afterwards. Uh, so if you don't, if you were not able to see everything during the demo, uh, this will be shared afterwards. Yeah, one more thing. <laughs> um, um, it is not, I mean, this is not a feature uh, that is part of uh, Traffic 3.0, uh, but this is something we have been working on for quite some time, and I think this is uh, pretty exciting. So I wanted to uh, uh, to uh, give you um, a few insights on what uh, is happening here, and uh, this has to do with uh, performances. Uh, and uh, let's let's just do some benchmarking. So we will set up. Um, uh, a benchmarking uh, uh, infrastructure with uh, three different servers. One server, which is a backend server, which basically run a simple web server, uh, nothing crazy. Uh, we will add um, a gateway server, a reverse proxy, which will be either traffic or nginx. And on, on top of that, uh, we will add a third server, which is uh, the benchmark server, the client server that will uh, use WORK to send thousands of requests every second uh, to, uh, to, um, to the backend server. Nginx will be used on the latest version 124 and uh, traffic will uh, be used with uh, 2.11, the uh, uh, latest 2x version uh, 3.0 and the uh, special version fast HTTP uh, that I want to talk about that I want to showcase. Uh, and this special version uh, is basically a revamp uh, of the uh, uh, reverse proxy pipeline uh, with some, let's say, memory allocation optimization. And let's see how it goes. I hope it will be less blurry. <laughs> Okay, let's start traffic uh, 2.11 um, and uh, we will also start WRK uh, on this, um, on this uh, web server. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, 54K request per, uh, 53K requests per second. Okay, let's start traffic 3 and the same uh, WRK request. Um, there, I mean, no work, no, nothing has been made on the, on the reverse proxy pipeline. So it's the same result, 54K uh, request per second. Let's now start Nginx um, and 
as you might guess, uh, Nginx is really a, a, a super um, fast reverse proxy. Uh, and we have a slightly better uh, uh, performance with 66K requests per second. And let's now start traffic with the fast HTTP optimization. Um, and what's interesting here is that we get 71K requests per second. So yes, um, that's better than Traffic 3, obviously, but that's also better than Nginx. So Nginx was 22% uh, uh, faster than Traffic 3, but Traffic faced Fast HTTP uh, is 77% 77 faster than Nginx, which is mind-blowing. and. It's even better if we compare to traffic three, which is 30% more performant. So um, yeah, to me, that's <laughs> pretty crazy because um, traffic is not only uh, the simpler or the most cloud native uh, reverse proxy out there, uh, but it's about to be the fastest. So, I mean, it's kind of super exciting. <laughs> All right, um, so that's that's uh, that was it. Um, thanks a lot.